Okay, hello everyone. My name is uh, Vladimir Vladimirovsky. I'm from Central, from Central Latvia, and today I'm here just to, to talk to you about uh, Java 9, and particularly about Project Jitso, which is one of its big features. I mean, I think everybody heard of Java 9. Does anyone try Java 9? Does anyone try to run something bigger than Hello World on Java 9? <laughs> yes, so that, 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 that's what my speech is about. So, uh, Java 9 release, which is planned in, in summer uh, of this year, uh, is quite expected event uh, in Java world. And uh, one of the key features of Java 9 is a project Jigsaw. And uh, it already uh, has ignited quite hot discussions around it because uh, Project Jigsaw is not really a jetpack but much more a safer uh, which is not actually common to Java World because we all would use that all new Java releases have some cool features, have some improvements. But uh, Project Jigsaw also provides us with improvements. Uh, for instance, it improves uh, dependency uh, check on compiler start time, it improves security model, I would say dramatically improves security model, but at the same time, uh, it provides significant restrictions uh, about how classes can access one another and about patterns uh, which are quite commonly used. So, uh, I did a small practical demo and try to run uh, some of the frameworks, uh, well, very small frameworks, uh, on Java 9 to see how it will go. And so this speech is actually about it. So, first, some, some theory uh, to get you familiar with Project Jigsaw. The video says that uh, Project Jigsaw or Java module system specified a distribution format for a collection of Java code and association uh, uh, resources. It also specifies a repository for storing these collections or uh, modules and identifies how they can be discovered and loaded and checked for integrity. It includes features such as version in the next phases, uh, with the aim of fixing some of the shortcomings of existing JAR format and what is more important, class pass, and to prevent JAR errors. So, does it mean that class pass is a bad guy? Well, uh, three years ago, I created a small sample project for myself just to test how several technologies will coexist. Just, just, just for fun, to be careful. And uh, here is a simple description of this project. It was made on uh, Java E 1.7, and uh, the back uh, the backend server was run on Wild Fly uh, 8.x server. Uh, actually, uh, this model uh, used Split Data JPA in Hibernate to interrupt this data source and Split Core Framework for business logic. Uh, also, uh, to communicate with front end uh, via REST protocol, JAXRX implementation was used, and uh, for the sake of development, uh, uh, this model was partially covered with video test. Front end uh, was used to uh, get some parameters and uh, send requests uh, uh, to backend server and uh, provide some transaction results as well. HTTP servlet was used to process calls and uh, to communicate with backend Apache which HTTP client was used. So totally we have nine technologies mentioned in this text. If we will run Marvin dependency plugin, it will already give us 42 libraries which should be used with this very simple project which I did through one of hot summer weeks, weekends actually. I don't remember one day it took for me or two days, but nothing more than three, four hours of work actually. So here is the class class. And it already takes a full page and uh, I bet it's quite hard from the first glance to say what's in this class class and if it's correct. So uh, let's discuss some more things about class class. 
One quite widely known thing after, after the JARCAM is a class pass collision. Uh, a class collision is when you have uh, some class with some specific version on compile time, but this class is present in a different version uh, in runtime. Uh, in this case, uh, the problem uh, is that uh, different versions of the same class might not be backwards compatible and uh, might not be compatible at all, not only backwards compatible. And uh, the problem, the key problem is that we cannot uh, actually define this during compile time or program start time. But we will only be able to see that we have some problems at the moment when a class will be referenced which in case of server applications can lead to hard to predict bugs which will appear, reappear, disappear, so that's how it will be on server world. And the real life example of such situation is actually JSL or SLF4J uh, conflict with SLF4J API. If you will uh, use such versions for SLF4J API and JSL or SLF4J respectfully, you will get exception no such method at all. It's uh, because uh, SLF4J API uh, changed some signatures of methods and JSL4J uh, already became not uh, compatible with uh, version 1.6. Other ways to shoot yourself in the food uh, are, for instance, Uber jars. And I have seen Uber jar in a big enterprise project for a huge investment institution. So it's not something which we only do during school. Uh, Uber jars is when you use a modern shape plugin, for instance, uh, combine uh, several libraries into one big library. Uh, and the problem is that after you complete this task, you virtually have no way of telling what's inside this Uber jar. Uh, another example is seeing the library names. That's something rare, but still it appears from time to time. Uh, so, uh, Project Jigsaw uh, actually provides the following goals. Uh, the first goal is improve the security and maintainability of Java and CR platform implementation in general and the JDK in particular. And the second goal is make it easier for developers uh, to construct and maintain libraries of large applications for both Java and CAE and platform. It is taken from official resources. I took the liberty to derive more practical, more technical ideas from those goals. So the first idea is actually to check types, presence, and accessibility during compile, link, or start time. Uh, instead of runtime, uh, or in other words, to, be, uh, to build a cyclic uh, type graph and compile time, or again, start time, link time. Mm -hmm. And the second goal is to restrict access to libraries and kernels while keeping API public. So that is something uh, which is tightly coupled with seven provider uh, public. Seven provider, uh, as we know, is a first class Java citizen. Uh, as far as I know, uh, originally, seven provider pattern was actually proposed uh, in Java. Uh, the main idea is that some uh, public API uh, is uh, actually intended to be implemented by third parties and uh, it's widely distributed as of now. Uh, so the idea itself, the ideas uh, provided above, they are not new. Uh, default methods and interfaces, for instance, uh, which appear in Java 8, uh, enabled us uh, to uh, enable us to uh, modify interfaces while keeping backwards compatibility in place. Uh, and actually, this is the reason why Spring 5 will be purely on Java 8. Uh, on DevOps, uh, the, one of the Spring co-founders who actually had a speech there said that, okay, you all benefit from Java 8, why can't we benefit from Java 8? We developers develop with the Zero much more than you do, because we can definitely benefit from the default methods from uh, in, in interface. Another thing is Mario and Ivy or other uh, uh, version control systems, uh, uh, sorry, dependency management systems of version control. And Jigsaw is never a replacement to that. I want to uh, stress out that uh, actually Jigsaw does not deal with versions. So it, it doesn't intend to replace Myron, Art, Ivy, 
and things like that. And here are some uh, examples of bad practices. Uh, for instance, base 64 encoder and decoder uh, prior to Java 8. Does anyone encounter it with those methods, use them? And the bad, the bad practice is very simple. You cannot use classes from some means library. I mean, technically you can, but practically you shouldn't. And prior to Java 8, uh, those classes, which are very handy actually, and I was really surprised, why are they in some means library? Why, why, why they don't include them? In, I don't know, uh, Java I.O., for instance, where they do belong to my uh, But uh, they are in some list library, and you shouldn't use, uh, you shouldn't have used those classes, because uh, uh, the contents of this library is, internal, for internal uh, Java purposes, it can change at any time. Another example is a class I'd say. If you want some black magic in Java, go find this class and there will be no such thing as restrictions in Java, but your application will crash. As uh, during last presentation, there was a good example with final variable. There is a way to actually make, make final variable not final, but people who know it will never get a job in the top. It's actually if you know how to do the trick. Uh, Okay, so uh, that's some uh, uh, ideas about Project Dixon, but let's get to the practical demo. So, I think a very simple uh, and uh, easy to explore uh, subset of technologies. So, very simple class, uh, hello G, so what it does, it's better stated in the slide. It just takes uh, uh, Java, uh, uh, sorry, Apache Commons logging uh, logger and logs hello Jigsaw. So that's all, all, all it does. To work, uh, it of course uh, needs uh, uh, some logging framework. And as, uh, as a logging framework, I selected SLF4J. SLF4J API is a uh, common for say, uh, which is used for many logger implementations. And probably uh, it's most uh, widely distributed framework as of now. Uh, but in order for the Select4j to work with my application, I would need a bridge because uh, I'm using uh, Java Commons logging framework and the Select4j is the Select4j. It's a different logging framework. This bridge is JSL over Select4j, very simple bridge which actually enables uh, 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 transparently with the application to write all the logs directly to Select4j implementation. Which I selected the simplest one, uh, the select for J simple, it just prints everything to the system. So that's the technology setup. Uh, compile graph is uh, trivial. Hello, Jigsaw depends on JSL over a select for J, which in turn depends on the select for J API as well as the select for J simple. Uh, in that time, uh, the, the following things are happening. Uh, Hello Jigsaw obtains uh, Java Commons login uh, uh, and inside of this Hello over select for j this login, uh, this, this login is provided from a select for j log factory which actually uh, gives you the bridging uh, functionality and uh, bridges a select for j loggers uh, to Java Commons login interface. Uh, then the select for j API has the following mechanism of obtaining uh, uh, exact logger implementations. It uh, calls a specific class, static logger reader, uh, and it should be uh, or the select for j equal static logger reader uh, class with a static method get singleton. And uh, it is expected that uh, implementation will provide this class and class path. Which it does. If you will run it with jdk 1.a.0, uh, you will see the following result. So that was about Java 8. Let's go to Java 9. I use this build. Uh, you can download it from uh, JDK 9, uh, Java Net site. It's freely available. It's not the latest one, but it's quite fresh. You can see it's uh, beginning of January. So it's okay. Uh, in order to convert our application to first, first of all, you can run this application with Java 9 without any changes whatsoever. You will run it with class pass arguments and it will work. That's because uh, this is the fallback 
which is uh, provided for uh, prior to Java 9 applications to work. I want to have a first class citizen in Java 9 world. I want to be uh, the program which works with modules. So that's what I, what I do. In order to work with modules, we need to briefly discuss what module is. Module is a name self-describing collection of code and data, uh, code and data is organized in packages. So nothing new uh, uh, as of here. Uh, just, we have two jars, one has package x6, another has package x4 and x1. Uh, provided both jars are in the same class path, they can easily access one another. In Java 9, uh, first change, uh, uh, two uh, modules or two jars cannot access one another at all. Uh, and uh, each module should have so-called module descriptor, which is uh, placed uh, in module root. Uh, it's a specific, specific file module in for Java, it has a specific syntax, but it's actually compiled into class. And this module info defines uh, module name, and module name can be different from uh, jar name itself. So some self-described capabilities are added. Uh, there is a golden rule that if two types S and T are defined in different modules and T is public, the code in S can access T if uh, S module reads T's module and T's module export T's package. Uh, so, if we will put in XXX package uh, requires full up, which means reads full up, and if uh, another model full up will provide uh, package foo with uh, calls exports, uh, import foo will work. Uh, please note that import foo bar will work because foo bar was never exported and uh, it remains private, so already a big difference to uh, prior to Java 9 world. There can be classes which cannot be accessed uh, uh, by reflection or whatever. They not just cannot be accessed by reflection because some security manager, manager is in place. It's even deeper. Those class uh, cannot even know of class existence. So if some package is not exported to outer world, it's as if this package never existed. So inside the model, of course, everyone can access everyone. Okay, so let's try to implement the modules for our simple application. The first uh, uh, module descriptor is uh, simple, it requires JCL over SLF4J, and JCL over SLF4J, of course, exports uh, common login. Again, I don't need to export common login input because it's not needed. Uh, not, not needed to be exported. Uh, okay, uh, then I will export uh, all uh, slf 4 API uh, uh, packages and uh, uh, leave slf 4 API uh, from JSL uh, over slf 4 So far so good, uh, but when I will try to somehow combine slf 4 API with slf 4 simple, I actually run into a big problem. Uh, the problem is, uh, that I have a second reference here. So if I will say uh, that a select for j simple requires a select for j API, which is true, at the same time it should export itself to a select for j API. Actually, please note that we can restrict to which packages we want to export our package. We will, uh, not, not packages, sorry, but to which modules. We not necessarily should export the modules to everyone. And uh, according to the rules, uh, it's not enough. And the select for j API should say that it requires all of the select for j simple. And this will not work. Simply because uh, uh, we cannot compile modules because one module requires another, which will really require the first one. So this is a side of reference. If I will remove this line, the uh, program will level around, but the problem is that uh, it defaults to no logger implementation, which, me which means that it cannot see a server for this simple at all. So, in Java 9 it's insolvable. And apparently, one thing we can do is stop, stop, stop our, uh, our application now and say, okay, that's, that's fairly, it's Java 9, but get used to it. 
Bet vēl tiek, ka tikšam tā proši, ka vēl ir faktors savas ar džēpiem. Ja tu nevar visu mums tur varu. First of all, uh, we need to talk about service providers. Uh, as I previously said, uh, uh, service providers is a first class Java citizen which actually used to provide services uh, which is extended by third party uh, implementers. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, let's say we have a package API which has some class I service. Uh, which is actually a service, uh, service interface and which loads uh, in runtime this class with service loader load and uh, uh, we have some package equal which actually imports uh, uh, package API and provides some implementation uh, let's say equal service of this iService interface then in service provider world uh, in Java 9, we can write uh, uses API as service for API and uh, provides API as service with simple service uh, for implementation, and this will enable those two modules to see one another. Uh, in order to do so, uh, as you uh, probably remember, uh, SLF4J API uses a different approach. Uh, it just uh, loads some static, uh, it calls some static method from some class and requires this class to be class pass. This will not work. Uh, so we will have to introduce some uh, iStatic logger builder with a single method uh, as a service interface. And uh, in static clause, we will have to introduce a uh, service load. Uh, uh, so it's a further way of loading a static loader builder class. And also we will need to do some changes for select for JSQL, uh, namely uh, we will implement a static loader builder and uh, we will provide in uh, manifest in meta folder of jar uh, file for the select for J and static loader builder and implementation which should be loaded. This uh, we will actually when we will add the clauses in our module descriptors, this will do the trick and well. So we will have this application uh, running on Java 9. Uh, what can I say as a conclusion? Uh, I heard a lot of contradictional uh, opinions about whether this is a good change or bad change. There are similar discussions about, for instance, uh, uh, clone, uh, clonability in Java. Who likes how clonable works? Uh, there is a simple discussion about serialization. It's very hard discussions. And one of the founders of Java uh, once said to me that if I would be in power, I would not do serialization at all, because serialization simply does not do what it was intended to do. But nevertheless, it's widely used, and it's already too late. So, this decision about uh, improvement uh, to class class uh, is quite serious one. First of all, uh, who thinks Spring will work with that? Nobody. And you absolutely right, Spring will not work with it. Spring out of the box, uh, use uh, automatic fallback loading if some class is not present class discovery in runtime, which will never work with Java 9, and how they will resolve it is a question of future. Uh, as far as I concern, there is still quite warm discussion between Oracle and Spring, because Oracle also cannot say to Spring, okay, we will do like we want and live with it, because this will not work. Spring guy will say, okay, don't use Java 9 for Spring, run it for plus plus, and it will be bad for, for everyone. So, uh, the main idea is that this change is significant and painful, but really only time, I think, will tell is it the fifth wheel to Java or just tail which uh, fell today. So, that's that's my case. If there are any questions, please. Actually, I can I can show you how this runs, but I don't know. It's <laughs> just a console with a lot of letters. So. Okay. <laughs> Um, what is your thoughts about uh, Voyager and uh, Java normalization in Java 9? Are there either future for Voyager in that case? Is it not hard? Well, uh, Java modularization. Uh, well, Java, Java modularization uh, is, I think, 
quite quite interesting topic. Uh, you are pretty not with Java. With Java it's a good technology, but uh, Java modularization uh, is tries to solve a big difference. Uh, Java modularization uh, in uh, how to put it. Just a second. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, so Java modularization uh, is actually allows to, to provide us with some uh, tiny uh, tiny JVMs, I would say, with only uh, those modules which are necessary for some application. I'm talking about this way of Java modularization. Yes. And so, with UI, uh, on the contrary, provides some dynamic uh, loading of uh, plugins as far as I can. So I'm not, I'm not guru of UI, that's why I was a bit uh, a bit in a mess <laughs> for the moment. But my personal opinion is that for mobile world is of course a benefit. And uh, I'm more for Java modularization in this sense than for SGI because I think uh, when it comes to mobile world, uh, what is most important is uh, simply that application should run as fast as possible with as less resources as possible. I don't think OSGI provides this. OSGI is of course much flexible than Java modularization approach. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, my personal opinion that on server world, probably Java modularization will not give that big benefits because, well, the servers, we don't have problems with memory, we don't have problems with hard drive. That's, that's what we might say. Thanks for the question. Uh, actually, uh, first of all, uh, maybe I'm somehow said it in the wrong way. Uh, the, the only restriction uh, we have is this module info file, which is a plain text file which can be edited. There is no restrictions like by hash codes or by some proprietary <laughs> format. Uh, which is actually not uh, uh, not the case for Java modularization, as far as I know. Because as far as I'm concerned, Java modules will be uh, will have some binary formats which will not be compatible with. Uh, like I'm not sure if they are proprietary, but as far as I remember, it's maybe I I just don't remember. But uh, talking about the restrictions, uh, it is not. Well, it is, it is not in the Java 9, a Gypsum is not intended to uh, provide a security features uh, in the sense of restricting us from puts and classes, class, in class class. You can easily put this class in modules.